A little bit of history about the club. It was the Women's Athletic Club in San Francisco. The war comes along, the war, World War II. This becomes the Waves Dormitory for World War II. Now you got tens of thousands of sailors and Marines shipping out from Treasure Island. You got thousands of soldiers from Fort Mason all the way to the Presidio, Fort Cronkite, etc. You had Hunter's Point, you had Moffett Field, you had Alameda as well as, as, as the uh, Treasure Island. This place became the hub of social life here. So at the end of the war, the Commandant of the Marine Corps said, buy that place. So we bought, the Marine Corps bought it in 1946, and he said, I want you to buy it because I want it to be a living memorial to Marines and soldiers and sailors and airmen who lost their lives in the Great War. I don't want a marble and a stone and, and, and bronze memorial, I want a living memorial. So we are a living memorial. The fact, that brings chills right up my spine thinking about the fact that we're in a living memorial. So we, we commemorate, we educate and we serve veterans. We commemorate their service. We do great programs here. So please give it a thought about joining. And we also have a 501c3 associated with us to take care of those who are non-veterans. If you want to make a contribution, we can accommodate that as well. It's my honor now to introduce the moderator. Tim went to West Point. He was an honor grad, well, a distinguished graduate. It means he'd graduated in the top 5% of his class. Being a smart guy like that, he went to ranger school. How many know what ranger school is? Yeah. And then he went to airborne. He's also an airborne guy. He's smart. 5% top of his class. What MOS do you, occupational specialty do you think he got? Infantry. Only the smartest go infantry. Okay. <laughs> Right, Tim? So, did two years in Iraq after his commitment, and he sits on the board of the Marines Memorial Association. I will tell you, he is the most dedicated, hardworking, and conscientious, no offense, Barry, of all the board members that I've got on the association at the time. Please, Tim, it's your show. Thank you. Thank you. So this evening, we have the lucky fortune stance and honor to have Chip Berg come uh, do a Leadership Lessons Learned talk with us. Chip's bio can almost be summarized in my day-to-day -day life. So when I wake up, I use a Gillette razor. Uh, Chip was very involved with that. Um, growing up, my dad always drank Folgers. Chip also very, very involved with that brand. Then when I, after I take a shower, put on some Old Spice, lo and behold, there's <laughs> Chip's career. And then when I slip on the jeans, Levi's, and present day Chip Berg. Um, but more on his background, spent 28 <coughs> years at P&G, uh, working on these iconic brands, did tours of duty overseas with them. Uh, in September 2011, started at Levi's, has been there for the past seven years, has really uh, led a resurgence in Levi's before that, there was uh, a bit of drift in terms of the brand. Levi's uh, is not only just the Levi's brand, but the Dockers brand. And um, uh, we're just very honored. Thank you, Chip, for being available. Awesome. <laughs> it's great to be here, really, an honor. So I have a fair bit of questions. You got a few brands, by the way. Uh, so you clean your house with Swiffer. That's right. You bake your birthday cakes with Duncan Hines. You make your peanut butter and jelly with Chip. Jif peanut butter. You snack on Pringles. I've touched them all, so. For sure, for sure. We won't go to the toilet or anything like that, but. <clears throat> Charmin. A lot of the audience, just like myself, we transitioned from the military. It was a interesting transition. Some of us went straight into industry, some of us went to school. I'm curious, what was your transition like? And how much would you say, and I have a tendency to overload questions, so I'll try not to do that. How much would you say your transition is similar to different than the current generation? 
Well, it's a long time ago now, so I got out of the military. I graduated from Lafayette in 1979, and I got out of the military in 1983. Um, and it, it was really a very different era back then. Um, when I got out, I had a three-month-old son. You know, everybody said when you go to Germany, you come home with either a child or a cuckoo clock. I came back with both. Or a German automobile. Yeah, and the child is still around. I don't have any idea where the cuckoo clock is. But um, I, uh, you know, first of all, I wrestled with whether to get out of the military or not. I, uh, I really loved, I loved the entire experience. And I was living in Germany still during the Cold War. It was West Germany. Um, we patrolled the East German border, my unit. Uh, twice every year. So I was in the 3rd Armored Division. I was an air defense officer. And... Uh, the Folda Gap. I think that's what they call Folda it. Folda Gap, yeah. So if you remember, if you, if you ever studied what World War III was going to look like, it was going to be the Russian horde coming through the Folda Gap. And uh, the 3rd Armored Division was kind of the second line of defense after the cavalry. And uh, so I'd be one of the first to go. Um, and. Uh, I was in the short range air defense unit that was attached to the 3rd Armored Division, 3rd of the 61st ADA. <clears throat> but young family when I got out, and I, made, I ultimately made the decision to get out in part because of my family. I, I just couldn't envision, you know, moving around every two to three years and eventually doing an unassigned, you know, on a company tour to Korea or someplace for a year or two years. Um, but, you know, unlike a lot of you in this room and unlike you, Tim, uh, I, you know, I never went to war, so I actually think the term veteran applied to me is almost gracious. I mean, yes, I served the company, and yes, I was in the service, but I never had bullets flying over my head like many of you. Um, when, I, when I joined the military and when I first got to my unit in Europe, um, my platoon sergeant and, and all four of my squad leaders had served in Vietnam. So. You know, I was 21 and almost 22 years old, fresh out of college, you know, butter bar, second lieutenant, and it grows you up really fast in life when you've got responsibility for, for men and your leaders, your non-commissioned officer leaders are all, you know, war-hardened veterans. And, um, you know, I learned so much in those couple of years. Um, mostly about myself. And I guess when I got out of the military, um, that's probably what helped me more than anything, is I really knew who I was and kind of what I liked and what I didn't like and what I was good at. And, you know, I'd like to say a huge part of my success, if you want to call it that, and I put it in, in quotes, um, and a huge part of my life and who I am is because of the ROTC experience and my in my military experience too. I also went to airborne school when I was a cadet. And, uh, and I look back on that going, I can't believe I jumped out of perfectly good airplanes. But, um, <laughs> but, but the whole military experience really made me who I am. I, I've got two grown boys and a nine-year-old son, or nine-year-old daughter. And my, my boys, I tried to get them to apply to military academies, go through ROTC, but you know, typical teenagers, they don't want to have anything to do with something that worked for their dad, so neither one of them have done it. But I'm still working on my daughter, so we'll see. I still have one more chance. So you said as you were leaving the military, you knew what you wanted to do. No, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew who I was, and I knew um, kind of what made me tick and what kind of environment. I, I knew what my values were. I knew what I stood for. Um, I knew what kind of leader I was, um, and I, I knew what kind of environment I would thrive in. And so that's when I started looking for a job, and remember I had a three-month-old kid, so going to graduate school was like not an option. I had to put food on the table pretty quickly. You know, so I, I really went about looking for my, where I was gonna start my career, my civilian career, really looking for the right fit and the kind of people that I wanted to surround myself with and I worked with one of the search firms that, you know, does the junior military hiring. It was Cameron Brooks. They're still around, I think. They definitely are. And, um, and uh, they, you know, started working with me while I was still in, in Germany. And then I did the, 
uh, you know, where they bring you to a hotel. It was in Austin, Texas. I still remember as if it was yesterday, and now it's probably almost 40 years ago. But, um, and I interviewed with a bunch of different companies and had second interviews and third interviews with a number of companies. I actually interviewed in two different places at P&G, in brand management and in sales. And I just felt like the brand management environment, the people that I met, um, that just really seemed right for me, the right kind of fit. And that's, the, you know, I got an offer there, I accepted it, and I think it was less than um, three weeks after I landed in the U.S. Uh, from Germany that I started my career at P&G. And uh, I still remember as if it was yesterday, um, walking in through the front doors of Procter & Gamble my very first day on the job, and you know, P&G is, is known for its promote from within culture um, and, and also known for what they call their up or out culture. So it was, especially in brand management, if, if you didn't make it to brand manager within a certain time frame, you were out. And they had this, and they were really good about it back then, not so much today, but um, they just had this methodology of weeding and feeding their organization and they were very, very quick to weed out the, the underperformers. And I remember pulling on the door, entering the, entering the company, thinking to myself, if I can make it to brand manager, my life will be complete. I mean, you know, I'm gonna be competing. My, my entire class in the division where I started, they were all MBAs with the exception of me. And, um, and I thought, you know, I've got to outlast all of these, you know, Harvard MBAs, Columbia MBAs, Tuck MBAs, Stanford MBAs. And I thought the odds were like so low, but I was the last guy standing actually out of that class. So, um, and, it, and it was a great place to begin my career. And I lasted there for 28 years. I mean, I, my, most of my adult life was there. The, I want to say the former secretary of the VA, is it Rob McDonald? Yeah, Bob McDonald. Bob McDonald. Um, also is a P&G alum. Yep. Did he start roughly the same time? And said otherwise, was there like a group of veterans at P&G? Were you all supportive or didn't know that each other were veterans? Yeah, so Bob was, um, I know Bob really, really well. Um, an incredible human being, West Pointer. Um, and uh, actually his son and my son went to preschool and kindergarten together. Bob started about four or five years before me and uh, was kind of technically a generation ahead of me at P&G. But at, at the time that I joined, um, they did have a fairly active you know, military recruiting program in place where they were, and I think they, they used firms like Cameron Brooks to, to top off their recruiting class. They put most of their emphasis on business schools and a couple of undergrad schools in, in brand management. And, and then as the recruiting year was coming to a close, if, if they still had needs, they would use the military as an outlet to bring in. And, and by and large, you know, a number of us did really, really well. I mean, I think the military really prepared me exceptionally well for a place like Procter & Gamble. And usually the stereotype is veterans, uh, PowerPoint rangers, you tell them what to do and they'll do it, not really creative. How much or how dissimilar is that to your transition? Uh, I, I would disagree with that stereotype completely. I mean, I still remember, you know, when I was interviewing, um, uh, talking about how in the military, you know, the military and the Army, is a, it's a machine. It's, and, but it's huge, and it's also a bureaucracy. So during the period of time I was in Germany, I was uh, a platoon leader, I was a battery XO, and then you know for the last two plus years I was the battalion adjutant, you know the S1, and um, and you know what I what I realized, especially when I became the battalion adjutant, is the only way to get stuff done is you just had to be scrappy, you just had to be scrappy, and that scrappiness I think was um, one of the things that Proctor liked in me when, when I was going through the interview process is, you know, yes, there are ways to get things done, but if, if it gets hard or there are obstacles, you figure out how to get it done anyway kind of thing. You know, not break laws, not do anything unethical, but you figure out how to get stuff done if it's important. 
And, uh, and that plus just the leadership experience, you know, were the two things that I think really set me up well for success at P&G. And uh, the typical millennial, my generation, we don't spend 28 years at a place. No, I know. Um, and, and, and how did you think about your career development? So, like I said, when I joined, I, I was like focused on the first three years, and if I make it through the first three years, I'm good. And um, when, I, when I joined the company, never in a million years did I think I would get to the level of group president and on the executive team of the company running a seven and a half billion dollar business. Um, that just seemed so far removed. And um, I, I think today's younger folks, and I think the work environment has changed. I mean, the companies have changed. And, and I do think, you know, staying at a company for 28 years is very unusual today. Um, that's not to say that I didn't consider leaving P&G earlier. I did a couple of times consider leaving earlier, but Every time I thought about leaving, um, the company always had something better in store for me. And um, not that I ever quit and got talked back in, um, but you know, the company did a great job back then managing careers of people who were really high potential. And I mean, I was, I was with P&G for 11 years when I got promoted to general manager, and I was running a $200 million business. I ran the cleaning, clean, we call it household cleaners, the cleaning products business, which was Comet, Spick and Span, you know, Mr. Clean, Less Oil, I mean, a bunch of brands that, it was not strategic for P&G. It was kind of an unimportant Swap category. Swap and mop. No, 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 that, that was earlier oh, in my career. Sorry. This, was, this was cleaning products. And we can talk about flop and solid, but, um, but uh, it, was a not, it was not a strategic business for us. And our two key competitors were Clorox right up the street here, where that's what they did for a living, and SC Johnson. That's what they did for a living. So they had two CEOs every day getting up, worrying about their entire company, which was focused on that. And at P&G, it was this tiny little $200 million business that nobody seemed to care about. And, um, but I was running that. You know, after 11 years at P&G, I was, what, 35, 36 years old. I had manufacturing plants around the country, and, and it was in that assignment where we came up, we, we developed a new strategy because the business was in decline. The strategy, oversimplified, was make cleaning fun and simple. And, yeah, it seems like an oxymoron, right? But out of that, <laughs> out of that came Swiffer. That, that feels and, like something the military would like say, like yeah, big, clean, I mean, no, fun, just, and simple. Yeah, no, it, it's kind of, you know, what's the biggest challenge that people have, to, especially even this was, what, 1994, 95? So, you know, I, I used to talk about our category as it was a category that was developed during the days of Donna Reed, when mom stayed at home and all she did was bake cakes, cook for the husband, and clean the house. Those days were long, long gone, right? This was now the days of two-income families. Mom was working, dad was working, everybody kind of trying to share the load, and, and nobody had time to clean the house. So it was how do you make it faster, quicker, and, and more efficient, and also make it kind of fun. And, and that strategy led to Swiffer, which led to Swiffer WetJet and a whole bunch of other products. So the business, when I got it, was $200 million. Today, Swiffer is over a billion dollar brand. And, uh, and it's probably the last real successful brand that P&G has launched, and that was now 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. Anyway, back to, the, you know, back to your, your question about 28 years. So at 11 years, I was running a category. I got sent to uh, Asia in 1999. and was made president of P&G at 1999. I had been with the company 16 years. I was 46 years old, or 44 years old, I think, when I was promoted to president. I was the fastest person ever promoted to president at P&G at the time. I don't know, I don't know if that's still true, but, but and it was an amazing opportunity. And, um, and then six years later, the CEO was trying to move me back to Cincinnati. I had just remarried. My wife was from China. She had only lived in big cities her entire life. She was living in Shanghai at the time when we started dating and grew up, she was born in Chongqing, 32 million people, um, largest city in the world. And so, you know, the idea of moving back to Cincinnati with her, that was like a non-starter. 
so I kept saying to A.G. Laffley, who was the CEO at the time, you know, you can leave me in Asia. I love it out here. I, I don't need to go back to, you know, I don't want to go back to Cincinnati. My wife won't move back to Cincinnati. And uh, in January of 2005, he called me up and he said, how about Boston? P&G had just acquired Gillette. And I said, okay, Boston we could do. And so I was the first Proctor person dropped into Boston. My point is, along my career, P&G did such a great job, and they really did, they managed my career. I mean, I, I, I one time I told A.G. Laffley, I don't want to be, C, I don't need to be CEO. I love what I'm doing in Asia, you know, I love what I'm doing. As long as I have an opportunity to make a difference on the business and make an impact on both the business and the organization and people, I'm good. And uh, that probably cost me the CEO job ultimately, but, uh, but I just had, so many great opportunities along the way that I don't know if I had bounced around from company to company whether I would be doing what I'm doing today. When you say manage my career, um, it, uh, through some of the things you've also said, it seems like you've taken tours of duty, so to speak, at PNG that were yep. kind of hardship tours. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that those like hardship tours set you up for later on? Totally. Um, great question too. Uh, I, I believe, you know, at the end of the day, it's the experiences you have in your life that make you who you are, um, whether it's military experiences or work experiences. So I worked, on, I worked on big brands, small brands. I worked on successful brands. I worked on crappy brands. I worked on brands that were only in the United States. Um, you know, so local brands like Folgers, like Jif Peanut Butter. Um, but I also worked on big global brands like Gillette. And um, you know, I worked on brands that were kind of challenger brands, number two, number three in the category. I worked on brands that were you know, market leading brands. Gillette had, at the time, a 72% market share globally. And um, you know, we kind of defined that category. So, um, and it's those combination of experiences that I think may, have made me who I am uh, as, a, as a business person, as a, as a leader, um, because every business faces you know, a different set of challenges depending on the conditions and the competitive environment. And, um, and I'm, I'm thankful that I've, you know, I, I still remember when I got promoted, being called up to the CEO's office. At the time, I was the marketing director on Folgers Coffee, which in the US was the second most heavily advertised brand that P&G had at that time. This was early 90s, 93, 94. Our television budget, our television media budget was over $100 million a year at that point in time. That's a long time ago, it's a lot of money. And second only to Tide. And I was having a blast. We were producing you know, one piece of advertising every month just about. And I was just having a great time and it was a fun brand to work on. The best part of work, waking up is Folgers in your cup. And, uh, and did some great advertising while I was there. And when he told me, congratulations, I'm promoting you to general manager on the hard surface cleaners business, and I knew a little bit about that business, you know, the, the little bubble over my head was, can you say no to a, to a promotion to the CEO, question mark? And the uh, answer was no, keep your mouth shut, take the promotion and move on. But, and, and now I look back on that, and that assignment was a great first, first general manager assignment for me, because it was really, really challenging. And talking about your career, it feels like you've owned like major P and Ls, but like it also sounds like you've lived like a madman life, like these brandings, like and like my my view of 1980s, 1990s business. Clearly, I don't know anything about it, but like the Hollywood perception is that you know there's consultants, there's madmen. Like how much of that was that your life, and how much was, did the military prepare you for that? Because I feel like the military doesn't prepare you for any of that. Well, I, I actually think the military prepared me for everything that I did in my life from the moment I left the military on. I mean, in terms of the discipline, you know, disciplined living, disciplined thinking, disciplined actions, it was a big part of what I got from the military. You know, the importance of, of you know, being focused on the most important things, the importance of delivering results, the importance of taking care of your people and really servant leadership all those things, you know, and, and more I got from my military experience. And I think it, 
it made me who I am, and I think it did prepare me for everything that that I, you know, that I did as as I was growing up in my c civilian career. Um, it wasn't really mad. It's funny. I grew up outside of New York City in the '60s. Okay, I was born in 1957, so the '60s. My dad worked for NBC. I lived Mad Men. That was my dad, and uh, you know, doing the bar car, smoking three packs of cigarettes. We lived in Westchester County, uh, about an hour outside of New York. He would take the train back and forth. Right by West Point. Yeah, right by just on the other side of the river from West Point, and um, and every now and then, you know, we would get a phone call at home, and it would be my dad calling from Brewster, because he fell asleep on the train, <laughs> passed out. You know, and once a month we would make a trip. Okay, that's the debt too. Yeah, 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 exactly. They do. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it, it wasn't really Mad Men when I was at Proctor, but um, uh, but close. I, I have a ton of questions and I'm trying to embody kind of the spirit of the audience in terms of like, um, you said manage my career, the company did a good job of that. I know in the past 10 years I've had a bunch of mentors, a bunch of people who have helped me, yep. um, and a lot of them have been veterans. I'm curious, at P&G, did you have mentors? It seems like A.G. Laffler, I've just read him through business school books, is like a demigod almost. I'm curious, like, what, did you have any mentors, were yeah, they veterans? Um, well, and I, and I was lucky to work, you know, A.G. is a Navy veteran, um, so he served in the Navy. He went to Hamilton College and served in the Navy, I think, during the Vietnam War. Um, you know, Bob McDonald, Bob was actually my boss a couple of times. Uh, he was my boss the last three years I was in Asia, and he was my boss when I was running Gillette after he became CEO. Um, uh, AG was my boss. So I had, you know, a number of bosses slash mentors who were um, former military, but I also had, a, 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 I had several mentors uh, in my career, some of whom I'm still in touch with. I mean, the, the, there was one person who was really instrumental in my decision to leave P&G, who was my boss for, I think, 12 years um, off and on during my career there. And, and to this day, he is still my mentor. I still communicate with him and see him occasionally. I've done my intel on your background, like read a bunch of your LinkedIn posts. There's not like yet a post by you of like, here are like three to five like career pieces of advice I'd give to young folks, or just, or even more specifically, young veterans transitioning. I'm curious if you had to distill those nuggets of wisdom, what they might be. Well, I think the first one would be um, back to what I said. Think, you know, think really, really deeply about who are you. You know, kind of what's at your core in terms of your values, and um, what's important to you, and what kind of work excites you. Number two, it's interesting, I just, I, I kind of penned a letter to my nine-year-old daughter about just tips of advice for life, but, um, you know, uh, number two is uh, in this letter to her, which is, you know, find something that you're passionate about, um, which it sounds like you've done. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs and people that start up their own companies are driven to it because they're they find something that they're passionate about and it's a unique niche or an insight that they can build a business around. But it doesn't have to be go start up a business. It could be, you know, I, I was passionate about people, really, and teaching. And you could say, well, why didn't you wind up going into teaching? Well, I had a three-month-old son and I was worried I wouldn't, you know, be able to, to give my family the kind of life. But I discovered as I was kind of going through the interviewing process of P&G how quickly you wind up managing people. And this promote from within culture really does put an onus on that first level line manager, a brand manager, three years, three and a half years with the company, all of a sudden you've got three or four or five people that are working for you, you know, high powered, talented kids coming out of business school that your job is to coach them and train them and develop them and, and help them to become successful. And your success is dependent upon their success. I got that within, you know, I wasn't even 30 years old when I was managing, you know, Harvard MBA you know, graduates. And, and, and that coaching and developing of people is something that is still really, really near and dear to my heart. I benefited from it early in my career 
and then you hit a point in your career and you realize it's, it's kind of pay it, pay it forward time or payback time. So um, find something that you're passionate about um, because if, if you're passionate, I like to say passion's worth 10 index points. Um, and it's kind of like if the corollary is it's not work if you're having fun, right? So if, if, you're, if you love it, you'll be good at it. Um, I think, you know, the, the third thing um, kind of related to the know yourself is find the right fit. You know, it's interesting. If you think about it, I've worked at three places my entire adult life. U.S. Army, how long have that been around? 250 years or something? Somebody probably knows the answer. Call it 250 years. P&G, 185 years. Levi Strauss, 165 years. Right? Okay, so we can conclude I'm not a startup guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like to say that Levi's is the original Silicon Valley startup. And, uh, and part of what I'm trying to bring back to that company is the startup mentality. But um, the point I was gonna make there is the importance of really knowing what's important to me in terms of values. And I've worked for three companies, or three institutions really, that have incredibly strong values. And those values connect with me on a personal level. And they are very consistent with my own personal values. And I think part of the reason I stayed at P&G for 28 years was because I was afraid I would never find a place like P&G that had those kind of values. And I, I did interview in other companies. And you know, you hear the stories about other companies, which will go nameless, but when the mic is off and the cameras are off, I might name a few. But, but you, know, you can tell it's just a different environment. And, and all you gotta do is pick up the newspaper and read the stories about some of the companies today where they've gone off the tracks, where values have been just obsoleted and, and how it's caused companies to go off the tracks. So I, I like to say, yes, my title is Chief Executive Officer at Levi Strauss, but I like to believe that my real job is Chief Values Officer. I cannot talk about and reinforce the importance of the values of this company enough. And it is, I think, one of the reasons those three institutions have been around as long as they have. But to get back to the transition, you know, find the right fit for you and your values and, and try to make your values a match with the values of the company that you work for. Because I think if you get into a situation where it's really inconsistent, you will find yourself at some point in time regretting the decision. And I know I have never regretted any of the three places where I've worked, in part because I know all three places, and I like to say at, at Levi Strauss, we will do the harder right over the easier wrong. And that is something that I pound and pound again is it's always better to do the harder right than the easier wrong because we're in it for the long term. So th those are three. Can I stop at three? Yes, sir. I mean, I, I could go on. But. That uh, is one of the um, mottos or sayings that is thrown around at West Point a lot, the harder right um, versus the easier wrong. This is going to be my last question, and uh, we'll open up to the audience. For, in terms of values, uh, right now in society, we're seeing like a huge swing back in terms of brands and values. And I think uh, another somewhat iconic, classic, uh, San Francisco brands like Patagonia. Everyone knows Yvonne Chouinard and the values, environmental sustainability. As I was reading about Levi's and, and your, uh, your writings about sustainability, not washing your jeans, uh, not having weapons, firearms, and Levi's jeans, I was like, this is, a, this is a San Francisco values company. How do you think about getting that message across? And uh, just because there's so many brands like Lisa's or Bombas that have a social component and it feels like Levi's has a huge social component that that would be a major draw for young consumers. Yeah, well, and, and it is really important. I, so I take no credit for this, okay, because it goes all the way back to our founder, Levi Strauss, the man himself, you know, 165 years ago when he founded the company, the very first year when he made a profit, he gave a big part of that profit to a local orphanage here in San Francisco. And so he really um, founded the company on this premise of profits through principles, and that's how we like to talk about it. 
and it, and it is very closely linked to doing the right thing. And this awareness that as a company is successful, it has a commitment to its stakeholders, its employees, its shareholders, but also the communities where it, it, where it operates. And, and so through the, the decades, um, you know, we have really tried to build on that. Um, and you're right, I, the, the office of the CEO, this is not about me, but it is the responsibility of the office of the CEO at Levi Strauss. There is an obligation and a responsibility to make sure that the values of the company stay strong, but to also not be afraid to stick, stick our neck out, stick my neck out, this is where it does get personal, to take a stand on issues, important issues, important matters of our day. And, um, and, the, and this company has a long track record of doing this. We desegregated our plants in the United States 10 years before it became national law. Um, we were the first company to offer healthcare benefits to same-sex partners a long, long time ago. Um, today, if you saw it in the news, the Boy Scouts have changed their names their name, right? It's no longer the Boy Scouts, it's the Scouts. The Scouts. This company took a very strong hard line stand when the, when the Scouts banned gay troop leaders and said, we're not, we're pulling all of our funding. And the company took a lot of heat. Um, you know, fast forward to current day, um, I have personally taken a strong stand because we were founded by an immigrant Levi Strauss was an immigrant from Germany. You know, so when the immigration ban happened in February of last year, we were the first company to stand up, or amongst the first to stand up to say this is wrong. Um, we filed amicus briefs to support the battle in the courts. And it links back to our basic values around human rights. We've stood up for DACA. And you know, the stories are heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching. Um, we're taking a stand on the refugee crisis now and what's happening with limiting refugees entrance to the United States. I think there are a lot of things happening, not to get political here, but there are a lot of things happening in this country that are anti what this country is all about. And, and we are one of the most American brands anybody can think of. And, and uh, so it, it's important, I think, for for me as the CEO of this company and for us as a company to take a stand on, on important issues that really are inconsistent with the values of this company. Uh, you said he's the better board member? Yeah. Up there? Yeah, okay. He actually does something. Yeah. I'm Barry Graham, Marine, and also on the board here. A, a factoid, uh, Chip, for you, Pete Folger, Folger Coffee, is a Marine and he's a member here and a lawyer in San Francisco. Yeah, we used to have a factory right down the street. Oh yeah, now he's, he's proud of it. Uh, my question, you, uh, you've talked a lot about the brand, the culture, the, I'm sure you have a number of loyal employees. When you first came to Levi, you probably also, as a CEO, had a charge about financial results and creating a sense of urgency and meeting financial projections uh, with a traditional bound Company. So could you talk about that balance about how you create that sense of urgency without employees saying, here's this new guy from P&G and going to make us do things and change the culture around here, and yet the board is telling you, look, we, we've got to meet some objectives. So how did you balance that uh, and both sides? When I was hired in 2011, um, the, the board wanted to bring in a new CEO from the outside and uh, the company had really struggled for the prior 15 years. So the quick history on Levi Strauss was the company grew like a weed during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you're kind of our age, you remember Levi's. I mean, I like, like to say, actually, J.C. Cur James Curley, who's the president of Levi's brand, says, if you were at Woodstock, you were wearing Levi's unless you were naked. And, um, and, and it's true. And everywhere around the world, uh, as, the, as the brand and the company expanded, they would enter a country, plant the Levi's flag, and the business would just take off. I like to say everybody's got a Levi's story. As I was doing my due diligence on the company before I accepted the offer, you know, I'd ask people, what do you think about Levi's? 
And, uh, and everybody went, oh, what an amazing brand. But you know, it's been such a long time since I bought a pair of Levi's. And, uh, but I did find out that everybody has a Levi's story. It could be first pair of jeans they owned, you know, going to high school, going to college, first kiss, first date, first fill in the blank. <laughs> my, my favorite Levi's story, my personal f favorite Levi's story, as a second lieutenant, the very first time I took leave when I was in, in Europe, uh, my wife and I, this is pre-kids, we, we bought two Eurorail tickets and backpack Eurorailed through the Nordics, basically through Norway and Sweden. And, um, and we did you know, what starving second lieutenants do. We backpacked Eurorail Pass, stayed in youth hostels or in campgrounds. And we were in a, in a hostel in Bergen, Norway. I still remember this as if it was yesterday. And you know what you do when you're, when you're traveling, when you're staying in youth hostels, the way you wash your clothes is you go into the shower fully dressed, take a bar of soap, wash yourself down, rinse yourself out, wring out the clothes, hang them up to dry, and then you come back in the next morning. How many, how many, of, how many of us have done that? Come on. I'm seeing people, come on. All right, so, so I go into the, into the bathroom, I put my wallet with cash, no credit cards at that point in time, for the entire trip on the windowsill, hop in the shower, wash myself down, hang everything up, go to bed, wake up in the morning and go, holy shit, I left my wallet and run into the bathroom. The wallet is there, the jeans are gone. <laughs> True story. That's the kind of brand Levi's was, okay? In 1996, in 1996, Levi's was $7.1 billion in sales, okay? Raise your hand if you were not alive in 1996. Right, we were all alive then, okay? In our lifetime, $7.1 billion in sales. That same year, Nike, $6.5 billion in sales. Okay, I had the president of the Nike brand come and talk to my leadership team, broad leadership team, nine months after I started, to tell the story about Nike and how they used to study Levi's. We were the most iconic, most studied, most benchmarked brand and company in the apparel industry up until that point in time. And he told the story how Nike wanted to be like Levi's. They aspired to be like us, as global as us, a brand as loved as us. 1996, $7.1 billion in sales. Five years later, $4.1 billion in sales. Half the company gone. And then from uh, 2001 to 2011, when I got there, the company just bumped along from about 4.1 to 4.3. One year the revenues would go up, but profits would go down. Next year the profits would go up, but the revenues would go down. Really inconsistent performance. So I was brought in by the board to get the business turned around. You know, to, and, and on my very first day I wrote down um, you know, that my goal was to make this company, to be and be seen, as the world's best apparel company and amongst the best companies in any industry. That was, that's what gets me out of bed every single day. And, and this is my line, he stole it from me, but I said, to make Levi's great again. <laughs> and he did steal it from me, okay? 2011, 2015. And, um, and so, now the good news is, um, so we, we created this concept of the 20 mile march. If you're a fan of Jim Collins, which I am, you know, that's one of the concepts in his, books, in his book, Good to Great. The concept of the 20 mile march is it's something you're gonna do come hell or high water, no matter what. And we established that we were gonna grow our profits, our, our top line, our revenue, and our bottom line, our profits, year in and year out, every year, in constant currency, no matter what. And we've now done it five years in a row. Okay, the first couple of years, it was modest growth. We kind of averaged between two and 3% growth the first couple of years, growing the bottom line a lot faster because we took out a lot of costs and restructured. But then last year, we kind of hit a, an inflection point and we grew last year, eight, our reported results, reported revenues grew 8% and 7% uh, uh, in constant currency. So we did hit an inflection point. Fourth quarter though was double digit growth. And then the first quarter of this fiscal year, which we just announced a couple of weeks ago, we grew 
and uh, we are outperforming everybody in the industry. Um, our profits were up 59% in the first quarter. And so, and, and the brand is back. I mean, that's probably the most important thing. The Levi's brand arguably hasn't been this strong since the day my jeans were stolen out of that bathroom <laughs> in, in Bergen, Norway. Um, you see the Batwing tee everywhere you go now. Um, that was a big part of getting this business turned around. But, um, and the shareholders are happy. We're, we're privately held. Um, the Haas family, uh, Haas Business School at Berkeley, you've heard of that, same family. Um, the Haas family is the main family ownership. Um, the company was public for a period of time in the 70s, but the family bought it back private. They were concerned about it winding up in the wrong kind of hands because the company does generate a lot of cash. And, uh, and it's been private ever since. And so the shareholders are happy because you know, the stock has gone up. We still have stock. Um, you know, the stock gets valued by an investment bank three times a year. So the stock has done really well over the last couple of years. Their dividends have gone up pretty dramatically. It's all public because we've got publicly traded debt. But um, the dividends when I was there, were, when I first arrived, was $20 million a year. This year we're doing $90 million. That's in a six year period, five year period of time. So the dividends are up almost 5x. Stock prices tripled in that same period of time. So they're happy. Um, and employees, it was tough early on because there was a lot of heavy lifting. There was a lot of change. And I will tell you, there were a lot of skeptics, probably still are to some extent. You know, what's a Proctor guy doing here running an apparel company? And, and in fact, they did a, there was an article in Fortune magazine after the first maybe two or three years after we had done Levi's Stadium. Like, I'm the crazy guy that did that too. And um, it was all part of putting the brand back at the center of culture. They did a fortune story and the headline was, um, I'm, I'm not an apparel guy, I'm a brand guy. And, um, but a big part of the job was making the brand great again and that's really where I was able to bring some experience. I'm still learning apparel, I'm still learning retail, there's a lot to learn there, but the brand is back and we've got a lot of momentum right now and my biggest worry now is that the company, that people get complacent and figure, think we've got it all figured out, because we don't, we've got a long way to go still. Still too early to declare success. First of all, awesome Levi's that you're wearing, 512s? Are those 512s? Awesome, nice. Nice, yeah, great. Dude's looking for a job. <laughs> um, so on Omnichannel, actually, so back to you know, the story and the turnaround, when, when I got there um, in the early days, I basically, we just sliced and diced the business a, a thousand ways from Sunday. You know, where do we make money? Where are we losing money? Where are we growing? Where are we declining? Um, you know, kind of what parts of our business are critical? Where are we overdeveloped? Where are we underdeveloped? Where do we have high shares? Where do we have low shares, where are there big segment opportunities? And through that kind of slicing and dicing, very you know, analytical approach to trying to understand the business, the strategy, what we needed to do was very, very clear. And we're public with our strategies. It's in our 10K. Grow our profitable core. So most of the profit and cash that we make on our business comes from Levi's Men's Bottoms, which is a huge part of the business, Dockers men's bottoms in the US. Um, our top five countries, top five developed countries, and our top 10 wholesale customers. If that collection of businesses is good, it throws off a ton of cash and generates a lot of earnings. Problem with that is those businesses are very big and very developed, very high shares. So, you know, we might be able to eke out one or two or three points of growth a year from something like that. But if you're not growing faster than the rate of inflation, you're dead, right? You're always in a position where you have to be restructuring. So the idea was that would fund everything else that we needed to do. So the second strategy was to expand for more, grow the profitable core, expand for more. Everybody can remember that. And that's part of the idea with the strategy. I wanted everybody, I could stop somebody in the hallway. What's our strategy? They can play it back. So expand for more were businesses where we were underdeveloped. Our women's business, very underdeveloped. Um, tops, outerwear, um, our segments of the business, footwear, segments of the business where we're just way, way underdeveloped. In fact, we don't even buy market share data for tops because we wouldn't even round to a one. 
And so that's the, the typical apparel rule of thumb is four tops for every bottom. We sell four bottoms for every top. So a huge opportunity. So, uh, and then geographically, China, India, Russia, Brazil, I mean, the basic BRIC countries, where we are also very, very underdeveloped. And then the third strategy is to become a leading world-class omni-channel retailer. So the omni-channel buzzword. This goes back six years, though, so it wasn't much of a buzzword back then. But, and actually, that strategy came from really just two observations. Number one, we already had 2,800 stores around the world. So we had a lot of stores. We better figure out how to get good at it. And we weren't good at it back then. Number two, the puck was clearly heading to e-commerce and online and digital and digital experience, especially with younger consumers, which by the way was an issue for us. We had what I call the lost generation from that decade of where the company was really doing nothing. And so we chose that as the third big leg of the stool because we saw that as a huge opportunity. And I also, I spent a lot of time in my early days walking through stores and going on listening tours with our employees and with customers. And all you had to do was walk through a couple of wholesale customers here in the US, even six years ago or seven years ago, and you walk into the store and you go, that's how our brand shows up here? And you know, sometimes it would look like a bomb went off in the, on the pad. And you know, no, no customer service on the floor and impossible to shop. And you go into our stores and great customer service and you know the brand shows up as true lifestyle brand it's more aspiration i was like we got to do more of this and reduce our dependence on the especially u.s wholesale which at the time um, u.s wholesale was more than a third of our total company business and uh close to 40 percent at that point in time so we needed to reduce our dependence on that and build up our omni-channel capabilities and we've invested a lot in retail and in e-commerce. E e-commerce, when I joined the company, it was completely outsourced, completely. And we had three people working full-time on e-commerce in the United States. Today, we've got about 100. We brought a lot of it in-house. We still outsource some parts, customer, the fulfillment part, the shipping, distribution, shipping. But the whole front end, we now do. We control it ourselves. We've made investments in it, pretty significant investments. We're trying to innovate there. We're trying to really build a world-class site for both brands. Um, on the question about brands and cross-selling between Levi's and Dockers, I'm a brand guy. They're two different brands. And so you can walk into a Levi's store, you're not gonna find Dockers. Because it's, it's a different consumer, it's a different experience. So we don't really, cross-selling. You go to Levi's.com, you're not going to find Dockers there. You got to go to Dockers.com to get Dockers. Dockers is, it's going to come back, folks. It is, we are doing some amazing product now. And if you haven't bought a pair recently, go, go get a pair of the Flex 360. Uh, I almost wore them today because I flew down and back to LA today. They are amazing. They're so comfortable. They've got a lot of stretch in them, but they don't look like crappy, stretchy pants. They, they're really just really comfortable good-looking, stylish, khaki pants. And um, that, brand is gonna, that brand is gonna have a renaissance, um, I'm here to predict. And, uh, and meanwhile, back at the ranch, we gotta keep Levi's growing double digit, which it's been doing here lately. So, um, but they're two separate brands that really are two different consumers. I mean, I own Dockers, I own Levi's, but I have Levi's moments and I have Dockers moments, and that's kinda, how most people are, so it's a, it's a segmented approach. We have two other brands just worth noting. Um, we have a, a brand called Denizen. It was launched as a captive brand at Target, and that exclusivity ran out a couple of years ago, so we now sell it in a couple hundred Kohl's doors as well, um, and, and we will continue to expand that brand. It's, it's more of a value-priced brand, so, but in Kohl's, we sell it side by side by against you know side by side with Levi's at very different price points. So at Kohl's, Levi's is kind of call it forty dollars averagely out the door. Denizen is twenty five to twenty nine dollars out the door. I was worried about cannibalizing Levi's down. We tested it, no cannibalization. Two different consumers. There's the value consumer and then there's the Levi's consumer, and um, and so you know that's. And, and we segment the consumers and, and communicate with them very differently as a result of that. The other brand that we've got is Signature by Levi Strauss. 
which started as a captive brand at Walmart way before my time. This brand's been around for 15, 17 years. Also a value brand, but at a 1999 price point in Walmart, incredible value. So if you're a value consumer and you're shopping for value, these brands really represent, and, and a lot of those consumers, Levi's will never be in their consideration set. They just can't afford it. And that's, that's okay, but we've got other brands for them that give them the same kind of quality and at a better value than, than, a, than a pair of Levi's. And so um, it's classic portfolio management of different, different brands. We've talked about military leadership. We've talked about legacy organizations. We've talked about uh, you going in there, transforming things. We talked about Bob McDonald. So I'm gonna ask a very loaded question. If in a couple of years from now or a few years from now, someone asks you, hey, would you be interested in running the VA? what would your uh, initial reaction be? Oof. Wow. Um, well, first, let me say this. I give Bob a lot of credit for going. And um, I think, you know, and, and, and I know Bob really well, and I am sure he worked like the Dickens to try to get that place straightened out. And and obviously there are still a lot of issues there. So um, I don't know, you know, a few years from now, I'm 60. I'm like, and I've got a daughter who's nine and I, I'm kind of like- George Schultz is like 95. I know, but he's not running the VA, just for the record, he's not running the VA either, right? So um, uh, I've got a nine-year-old daughter and when she's going to high school, I'm gonna be her full-time bodyguard. That's gonna be my job when I get to about that age. Um, I don't know, it would be a huge honor to be asked to do something. I mean, serving my country is something I'm really, really proud that I've done. And if the opportunity, the right opportunity came along again to do that someday, I would have to think pretty hard about that because that would be an amazing honor and opportunity. But, um, but I'm kind of busy right now and I'm gonna stay busy doing this for at least a few more years because I love what I'm doing. And, uh, and I've, you know, I've built my team, it's my team. A lot of them joined in part because of me and the vision that I had for Levi's. And, and it's been, like I said, I've got, I call it my noble cause of making this company great and getting it back to what it was in its, in its best years and, and hopefully getting it beyond what it was in its best years because that would be an incredible legacy. And, um, and, and at the end, it's that purpose that really drives me in what I'm doing. And so I'm not gonna leave until I feel like I've taken it as far as I can take it, and then I'll turn it over, hopefully, to somebody who will take it beyond. Yes, sir. And that's probably a few years away. You, you mentioned best years. There's the classic film, Best Years of Our Lives. I feel that at the Marine Memorial Club, there's a community of veterans, uh, Ben, Carl, a lot in this room that I've had uh, the benefit of um, having a community and friendship. Uh, and I know that all of us look to veterans who have really paved the path, have had amazing careers, have had been able to do uh, work-life balance, have had values in their lives. And uh, we're really grateful for you spending the time uh, this evening with us. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. It's been an honor.